Okay, right. Um, my name is Hugh, and over the next 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give you all uh, an Exploration 101 crash course on how you go about searching the Earth's crust for metals and minerals, and I'll be using my experience of searching Morocco for copper and gold in order to illustrate this. So I'll start off by giving you a brief introduction to what mineral exploration is and why it's important. And then I'll spend most of my time going through the exploration process, giving you a flavour of the things we sort of do, and summarising with a few take-home messages. And I'm usually an advocate of at least giving one of these messages now, just in case I lose anyone. So by the end of this, I'd like you all to have a better understanding of what we do in mineral exploration. But also for the A-level students here who may be considering uh, the UCAS applications right now to study geology at university, or maybe even a career in geology overall, hopefully you guys maybe have uh, some interest sparked by what you see. So, potentially some opportunities for you. So what is mineral exploration? In the broadest sense of the term, it is simply the process by which we search the planet for natural resources in order to mine. And that makes me sort of the magpie of the geology world because I'm interested in anything that is shiny and or colourful. And this ranges from everything from gold, copper and silver all the way through to your things like diamonds and gemstones. And why is it important? Well, there's an old saying by someone I don't know, but if it can't be farmed, it must be mined. Okay? And this is largely true for all of our commodities. And these commodities and metals in particular are needed by absolutely everyone and everywhere both in a direct sense or an indirect one. So, for example, um, everyone these days tends to have a mobile smartphone, and in a single mobile smartphone, there's over 60 different types of metals. They all have to come from somewhere, they have to be mined, and mineral exploration is the way we go about finding them. So, crash course, here we go. Starting the exploration process is research, okay? And this is purely a desk-based um, operation. And what you'll do is you'll go online, you'll look for geological maps, you'll look at governmental databases, and you'll basically try and find an area of the world which has potentially got some undiscovered metal deposits. And once you've picked an area, what you'll do is you'll do a bit more of a detailed study, looking at articles, published papers and books, in order to get a really good idea of what you're going to try and look for. In my case, um, I would look in Morocco, because is where my country operates, and we've identified a little area just east of a town called Awazazat, which we think could have some copper and some gold, which is where we'll take uh, the next step, which is targeting. Okay? And satellite photography, satellite imagery, similar to what we just saw with Aylesbury's presentation on Mars, is the way we go about finding some interesting features. So can one of the A-level students potentially tell me what feature this is? It's not a trick question, let me show. Does that help? And does that help? <laughs> Fair enough then. Yep, by the way. Is it a fault? It is a fault, okay. So you see there you've got an east-west trending fault, displacing some dikes in a sinistral motion which is to the left. And this is really interesting for geologists such as myself because wherever you have a line of weakness in the crust, you get the potential for hydrothermal fluids to percolate along and give us some metal deposits. But satellite imagery like this for targeting is also very useful because in the bottom left-hand corner, southwest, you can also see a little artisanal working. Now, artisanal working means one man and his dog has found some metal, he's going to go mine it. But if one man and his dog, with no degree and no experience, has found some metal, chances are there's a lot more to look for below the surface, which we can potentially mine. So once we've done that, the next stage is actually getting some boots on the ground. This is our geology, this is our field work, okay? And a lot of what we do is geological mapping. And you'll learn about this if you do go to university, uh, you'll have a big old mapping project. But it's essentially looking at what rocks you have and drawing them on a map. So if there are any geographers in the room who do like colouring in, there is something for you here. There's always time to convert. What you might also do is have a look at some of the artisanal workings um, that you've already identified in the previous step. And also, you might go around doing some prospecting. And that's essentially, again, looking for anything shiny and colourful. And you might come across some really nice examples like this. But it's not just geology we can use. We can actually bring in some chemistry. Geology and chemistry, geochemistry, sounds scarier than it is. But the reason why this is important is because this allows us to find out exactly what the rocks are made of. And that's important because we want to know if there's actual metal in it that we can go ahead and mine. So the way we do this 
is we take some samples from our interesting and perhaps less interesting rocks, okay? We then send them to a certified laboratory. And basically what these guys do is they dissolve the rocks down and they can measure exactly how much of each metal they find in there. Okay? And then what the laboratory does is that gives us an actual readout. For example, the top sample has about 8% copper, which is a high-grade sample. That means we can potentially come and mine this area. But the bottom sample, nothing interesting, nothing important. We can throw it away and look elsewhere. Alternatively, what we can do is look under the microscope. So what you might have done at school with uh, looking at leaves or blood cells, you can take a really thin slice of rock, put it in a glass slide, put it under the microscope and try and find some small minerals. And in one of our samples that we did uh, pick out, we actually did mind to find, uh, manage to find some visible gold. Now, I have that very sample here with me today. Um, it is visible to the naked eye, fortunately. Um, and I thought about passing it around, but I appreciate it is quite pocket-sized, and I would like it back. So if you'd like to have a look at it, come have a chat at the end. In a similar vein to the chemistry, we can also combine geology and physics. Okay? And instead of looking at the chemical properties of the rocks, we can look at the physical properties of the rocks to give us a, potentially a better understanding of what's beneath our feet. And there are some examples there. But in our license, in our project areas, we know that our copper and our gold is quite closely associated with our magnetic dikes, okay, magnetic mafic dikes. So what we do is we give one of the geologists a bit of a backpack. It's essentially a big magnet called a magnetometer. And he'll go across our license, walking back and forth, doing some mapping. And the magnetometer will be able to tell us exactly whereabouts with the cold colors, for example, where we have low magnetic rocks, not interesting, but also in the centre there where we have some warmer red colours where we do have magnetic rocks and potentially where we therefore have copper and gold. And a bit of clever mathematics can actually tell you whereabouts and give you some structures potentially to follow as targets. Here's an example um, of what we have actually produced ourselves in one of our licences. And the main thing to take away from this is you can see many multiple parallel structures Northeast southwest trending, which is showing warm colours, and these are our mafic dikes. And these are, as we said, commonly associated with our high grade copper results. So, the last step of the exploration process is drilling. Okay? This culminates all the previous steps from your, uh, your desk based work through your field work. And the reason why it's last is twofold one, because it's really expensive, um, and the other reason is that it's the only way you can actually see what is below the ground. Okay? There's no other technique that we know of where you can actually see the rocks. So basically what happens is you'll get a big old drill rig, you'll aim it where you think you might have your copper and your gold, and he will send a large metal rod, which is hollow, diamond encrusted at the top, he'll spin it really fast and he'll push it into the ground. And because it's hollow, you can then pull out the long rod of rock, which we call drill core. Um, and you can have a look at it. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is where you can make or break your exploration project. The reason being, you can now finally have a look at the core and see whether or not you do have the metals you're looking for. And if you do, this is the stage where you can potentially really start thinking about turning your exploration project, becoming a success, and turning that into an operating mine. So, take care messages. First one. Mineral exploration is very important indeed, as I said at the start. Does anyone remember how many metals went into a phone? 62. There you go. Every time you want a reminder, use your phone. Next point. I hope that everyone today has now got a, a better understanding of the mineral exploration process, what's typically involved. And as I said at the start as well, the third and final point is mainly targeted for the A-level students here, that hopefully today you've seen something that has maybe sparked your interest and has given you a flavour of what you might expect to see um, if you were to become an exploration geologist. So hopefully that can inform some of your decisions as you go ahead and uh, move on into the world. Plus, there's probably very few professions where you can go out and get paid to have some stunning views such as these. So thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I like to think this talk might tie in quite nicely with some of the talks we've already had today. Uh, but I'm going to introduce some of the findings of uh, some field work in Georgia, the one near Russia. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, so just to talk about what we're going to go through today. Uh, first of all, we're going to introduce what we had at the, the death study stage, so sort of give the idea of regional geology. Then we're going to discuss one of the problems that we found and the methods we used uh, to investigate that. Then we're going to wrap things up with some conceptual models and uh, explain what happened in the end for the project. I spent about seven months in the country, and most of that time I spent geological mapping. Uh, I didn't work alone. I was with three other people. I've got, uh, got a laser. I've got Tom at the top, Laura and Natia, all providing great scales for the rock. Uh, and there's some uh, two managers, Anthony and Tom, as well. So, where are we? Uh, Turkey's been in the news a fair bit recently, so it seems like a good place to start. Uh, but we're just to the north of it, uh, to the south of Russia, near the Black Sea. Uh, tectonically speaking, we're in a collisional environment, convergent boundary. And to give you the idea of what we had at the sort of death study stage, uh, we were looking at a paleo environment of something similar to uh, Indonesia, like an island arc kind of setting. So you had intermediate uh, igneous rocks. Some of those have been reworked with the, the oceans and what have you. Uh, you then have the intrusive units beneath those that fed that system. And because of the tectonic setting I've just explained, those have then been folded and frosted. I'll just go, sorry. So just, we'll now zoom in on this little red box here, which is the site area we worked on. Uh, so this is a hydropower scheme. So we had one dam and two weirs, and these funnel water into tunnels, which take them to a power station here, and then the water exits back out the lines of the tunnels. So things all started well. Geological mapping. Uh, Going round, uh, we, we found some, some granite diorite, uh, looked very competent. Uh, a reminder for the youthful people here, if you drink too much beer, you might end up <laughs> looking like that. <laughs> um, we've also got some andesite with a, a family for scale as well. Uh, always going well. Uh, but then we got to Kedah, which is where we're gonna, we were looking at putting an underground powerhouse. So these are huge underground caverns, the kind of thing that Batman would use. Uh, and in those, you have these huge turbines. So it's quite important from a, a structural point of view. How can you keep these open? And when we got there, the, uh, the rocks looked like this. Um, so you have... Uh, you could walk up and just put a knife straight in it, really, really soft. Uh, it was full of minerals uh, such as pyrite, sericite, uh, and some clay minerals. Uh, so we were concerned this wasn't just weathering that had uh, weakened this rock. Uh, so we put a borehole in. Uh, and don't worry, if you wear a hard hat backwards, it does still work. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> and the core ended up looking something like this. So the observant amongst you, that's supposed to be about eight metres of core in a four-metre tray, and most of that looks like it's empty. And this, it was like this down to the end of hole, which was about eight, uh, 80 metres down. So we then realised that we weren't dealing with something that was just at the surface. This would have been at depth. And... I'm sure you can guess what we thought it was. Uh, so we're at Kedah, and we inferred that it was some sort of hydrothermal alteration that had uh, weakened the rock. So we then had to consider two other alignments for going around it. So we could either go to the north or to the south. But this also meant we only had a couple of months to go back to the drawing board and plan how we we're going to investigate that. So we did a, another death study in the field. And what we thought, because of the geology we discussed, we were dealing with something like a porphyry system. Uh, so that is, you have a, a cooling magma chamber at the end of the sort of volcanic phase. As it cools, you get, uh, due to a chemical reaction, you get a load of fluid released. And this comes out and mechanically breaks the rock and chemically alters it in all sorts of various different guises. It's important to remember this is extremely complicated. And many of these can be then overprinted, so you can have multiple phases of fluid being released. And because we only had a couple of months of mapping and a handful of boreholes, we had to come up with a simpler system for trying to map this out. Um, so we went for like an adopted weathering scale, because if you think of weathering at the surface, you mechanically break the rock with bugs and bunnies and you uh, chemically change it. So maybe not that dissimilar from what we're dealing with. Uh, I won't go through the details too much, but you range from completely altered, and that's where you can stick your knife straight in it, and then it ranges up to slightly altered. 
Uh, and this would be just as strong as other rocks you've seen in the area, but you'd have those indicator minerals such as sort of pyrite, uh, lots of chlorite, things like that. And if you found that rock on the road, sure enough, a bit further up, quite often you'd, you'd then find more highly altered material. Uh, we also had a handful of boreholes, and we believe that these sort of correlated together. Can any of you see that at the back? Probably not. So each of those little specks are outcrops that we mapped. So we went all around, and that's presented on LiDAR data. We then tried to zone it, and we ran a GIS query, which meant that we could get a relative proportion of each of those types of alteration in those areas. Uh, just to give you an idea, the sort of blue zone would be like an intermediate zone with some alteration. The brown and orange were getting worse. And the green, my apologies to any chalk specialists, was the pluton. Very sorry for that. It was, colours are always an issue. I know, I know. Uh, so to view that in 3D, uh, we've now just switched to the north. Kedder, which I sort of introduced earlier, was just down there. And that's our pluton. If we try and cut that away, uh, because of the high level of alteration at Kedder here, we inferred that the pluton might have been quite shallow underneath the river there, and that's what had caused that high level of alteration. If we cut away again, so this was the, the northern tunnel alignment option, we also had a zone of alteration here, which we inferred was from sort of some sort of dike, perhaps. We found some evidence of this. Uh, but either way, you're looking at tunnelling through a great deal of very weak rock here, uh, about four kilometres, I think, we estimated. So that meant we looked at the southern option, which has, at the top of the mountain there, it would have been about 1,300 metres of cover. So the tunnel's under enormous pressures here. And although at the top of the mountain there was no sign of alteration, these sort of minerals we spoke of earlier, because the process comes from depth, we struggled to prove that you wouldn't have gone into it at this sort of high pressure. So coming back out, to prove this is not all conjecture, uh, what we tried to pick was what we said was like the midpoint of the pluton. And what we did there was we measured out from this in all directions and sort of plotted that as an x-axis. We then plotted all the, all the GPS coordinates of all the outcrops we mapped as a y-axis and produced a plot like this. Uh, you can also see, a bit of a mess, I apologise, but you can also see we've got borehole sticks on there as well, which we also interpreted. And you can see that gives, gives that kind of shape that we were showing in that model. In addition to this, and factoring what uh, Hugh said earlier as well, these little uh, mining symbols here. So Natia was a Georgian geologist I worked with, and she had USSR maps from the 70s, and they found these, these sites of artisanal mining, albeit not active now, where they were looking for things like copper. Uh, <laughs> in addition to that, we have what we believe to be some soil sampling data as well in these wibbly lines. And broadly speaking, that fits with the zone that we picked out. So to summarise... Uh, this is where we started off when we got out there. Uh, we then found the alteration zone at Kedah. We looked at these two other options, uh, but due to our findings, we then concluded it was much bigger. And that has meant that a small team of geologists have significantly, in this case, reduced the scheme uh, from what would have been, to put it in perspective, a $300 million project down to about 170. million. And it's quite rare that the geology has that level of impact. I know we try to make projects bigger and better a lot of the time, but perhaps this is one of those ones where it's good to make it smaller. So just to summarise what we went through here, uh, we identified a, a problem with the geology, this hydrothermal alteration. Uh, we developed this methodology for exploring it uh, with regards to this modified weathering scale. We then developed the ground model and presented this to the client, this similar sort of presentation to the client. We then went into the field with the client, and they saw all the rocks, they looked at the core, and we argued for days. And at the end of that, it led to this significant change to the project. And with that light note, I invite any questions. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk to you today about cost-effective ground risk management with a particular emphasis on small sites. As a majority of you are probably aware, 2017 is the Geology Society's year of risk, so I'm hopefully going to fit this in quite nicely. 
So first of all, what is ground risk management? Ground risk man management, in its simplest terms, is the identification of any hazards with it, uh, in the ground which may pose a risk to a project throughout its lifespan, with the aim of once identifying these hazards to mitigate them through engineering solutions. To successfully do this, the best way to do it is to design a ground model which takes into account your understanding of the underlying ground conditions by considering your geological information, your geographical setting, any desk study considerations, and then your targeted site investigation, pulling it all together, which then allows you to come up with a suitable solution which mitigates all the risk. I've chosen to concentrate on small sites. In comparison to larger sites, small sites tend to be owned by private individuals who have a very limited investigation budget, and as a result, as a geologist, you have to be quite smart and understand the underlying ground conditions at every step so you can mitigate all the risk and really plan your ground model. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk to you about a case study of a project I've just been working on in Bath. So located about six kilometres southeast of the city of Bath, this was an existing bungalow on a small site where a developer was looking at knocking it down, increasing the size and the changing the layout. As you can see here. So the first thing I did when I got this project was to interpret the underlying geology in the geographical setting by using a number of sources, which would allow me to understand any potential problems associated with the ground conditions. So the red spot here roughly marks where our site is, which is founded on Charlfield Oolite um, member, which was, used to be known as the, the Bath Oolite, which is basically an oolitic limestone. Downslope, I've got the Fuller's Earth, which is an interbedded kind of clay and mudstone which has also got some landslip marked within it. And upslope, I've got the forest marble, which is predominantly kind of a mudstone. Um, other interesting features to note are this old historic adit, which goes into the hillside, along with this disused mine shaft. So if I pull this all together, I come up with my initial ground model, which may look something like this. The approximate location of the site, the landslip with its inferred boundary within the Fuller's Earth. And at this stage of the project, the risk isn't all that great, but what's worth noting was the previous kind of add it and the, the old disused mine shaft. So what I want to do now is try and add to this ground model by interpreting any death study information that I've got available to me. Of particular interest in this project is the historic maps, which show that the area is actually surrounded by a lot of historic quarrying. You've got one marked here, you've got the entrance to one here, and you've also got one here. Now, upon further investigation, I was actually able to find the underlying old mine maps for Westwood Mine, which followed this quarry in and just to the south of our site, and it basically undertook some um, room and pillar mining where it abstracted the uh, underlying oolite from beneath the forest marble. So at this stage, the level of risks actually increased quite substantially. There's a lot of historic mining going on as well as quarrying within the area, so there could be a potential risk to the client. So what I thought would be best was to go and undertake a site investigation, uh, sorry, a site visit to go and see what it looked like. On arrival, the actual existing bungalow was in pretty good condition, but what was of note was the front garden, the under levels were all over the place. Something very bizarre was going on. You had undulating dips, you had a, something that didn't quite look right. So pulling this all together, I revised my ground model for a worst case scenario and thought, well, the levels at the front are all over the place. There's mining to the south where they potentially chased a quarry into the underground mining. So there is a potential hazard that the whole of the site is on a backfilled quarry. And as such, we need to mitigate this potential risk. So at this stage of the project, my costs aren't that great. All I've done is spent a bit of time looking at old death studies, interrogating the underlying geology. And I've got a pretty robust ground model, but at this stage, it's conceptual, nothing to prove in. So what I need to do now is go and undertake some intrusive site investigation to basically prove or disprove my worst case scenario. So this is what I did. So in an ideal world, if you've got millions and millions of pounds to spend, you'd go and undertake boreholes on a two by two meter grid to 30 meters and you'd understand everything below. But as you mentioned in this talk, drilling is the most expensive stage of any investigation in any field of geology. So as such, at this stage, I thought it'd be best to go and undertake some trial pitting, base this around what the proposed development was going to be, and also this strange behaviour going on at the front of the garden. So that's exactly what I did. And what I found were these massive boulders, 
all these random orientated, I mean, this is one of the trial bit, you've got frequent claps, and as such, we didn't want to get too close, so there's no scale in that photo, I'm afraid. But you've got all these huge different sized boulders, they're all randomly orientated, they're showing no structure, and you can tell straight away that it's not in situ ground, it's been backfilled. Conversely, in the north, in the north, uh, sorry, southwest of the site, you're, you're pretty much onto solid rock, which required breaking out once you're below some topsoil. And somewhere in the middle, we found this rock ledge, which was then on solid rock on this side and backfilled on that side. So back at the office, I draw up my findings. They look something like this. So I've got all this known made backfilled ground here in the northeast. In the southwest, I'm onto solid rock. And somewhere in the middle, there's a potential ledge between the two. But at this stage, I haven't quite mitigated all of the risk involved in the project. The guy is looking to develop wants to stretch out over here. I haven't proved the bedrock in this area. I've only proved it in here. And somewhere in the middle, there's something very strange going on. So what do I do next? I've got to follow this up by doing some supplementary borehole investigation. So as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to borehole investigation, it's a very, very expensive process to do. So the best technique I used, or best te the technique I thought was best in this scenario would be to undertake a degree of rotary, bore, um, rotary probe boreholes following two transects. Now the idea behind rotary Pro boreholes is you don't actually core the rock to recover it, but in, instead you, you spray up your drill string and you measure the time it takes to infiltrate the ground. And the idea behind it is if you're going through made up ground or backfill ground, the drilling is very quick because the ground's not very strong. As soon as you hit the rock head, the drilling time takes a lot longer because you're into rock and therefore you can infer where the potential historic rock face might be. And just to make sure, that we're 100% confident. Once we did infer this rockhead, what we did was we changed the barrel and we did some actual in situ core drilling just so we could see the structures. So this is us on site undertaking some drilling. And these are the results of my drilling, roughly southwest to northeast. And what you can see in these graphs, hopefully, is the jump from when you're in the, the made up ground, which is easy to drill through and takes barely any time, until you hit the rockhead, which takes a lot longer. And as you can see, as you move from southwest to northeast, the depth of this rockhead increases, which fits into our original ground model of thinking that the backfill quarry is over in the northeast. So if I tie this all together with my trial pit findings, I might be able to come up with a cross section which looks something like this. And you can see where we've inferred where the made up ground is, where these times have been slow and then got quick. I've added these to my borehole, uh, my, sorry, my trial pit investigations, which didn't bottom out. And at this stage, we're fairly confident that we've understood all of the underlying ground conditions and as a result, can design some suitable engineering solutions which allows this project to progress. So if I put this into the wider ground model from earlier, what, what I can plot on here is basically the historic quarry phase, which only comes up to half of our site. So the rest of it is founded on in situ rock. The rest of this side of it is obviously being historically quarried and backfilled. So now, what do I consider as an engineering solution? Well, theoretically, if the house was going to stay in the southwest, it would be fine, because you could dig your hole down to two, three meters, pour your normal foundations and build your house. But sadly, the developer is looking to move the house and bridge basically your in situ rock and your made up ground. And as a solution, this just won't work, because you'll end up digging and digging until you find the rock. So the best or most adequate and most cost effective solution would be to undertake a series of rotary piled foundations which go through the made ground and then are anchored into the underlying bedrock. So to summarise, as a geologist in any field, it's important to have a dynamic ground model which you revise and change as your findings of the investigation change from the early stages of your geology and death study right through to your site investigations. As such, this allows you to come up with suitable engineering solutions which can mitigate the risk and allow the project to carry on successfully. And in terms of cost, the entire project cost for this came in just under £7,000. But without undertaking this, you're probably looking at fifty to maybe £100,000 if the, the developer was to just go in without doing any previous work because he'd come across risk in the ground and, and problems that he just wouldn't be able to handle. And the future, I mean, these small sites seem to be becoming more frequent, and I think that's 
mostly buoyed up by the fact that the, the housing market nowadays makes any developer kind of look at these and think, oh yeah, I can do it. With, and with the cost of suitable engineering solutions going down, they make them a lot more feasible. Question. Um, my presentation is about recycling our land, and it's a geophysical case study. Um, I'm a geophysicist, so please don't throw things. Um, so I'd just like to take you through one of our um, studies that I've done recently with our team and uh, explain it to you, really. So have any of you thought what might be underneath your house? You know, where it's built? Are you on a new housing estate, fairly recent, or, or an older property? While well, a lot of houses now are built on brownfield land, this is land that's been previously used for industrial or commercial purposes. It may have been contaminated with hazardous waste or pollution. Brownfield sites are being used more and more nowadays to fulfil Britain's ever-increasing housing requirements. However, many local planning documents encourage regeneration of these sites before greenfield sites, less risky sites, are opened up. This land, brownfield land, needs to undergo several surveys to ensure that it's safe for development before the uh, development process begins and to enable developers to be aware of all the hazards associated with the site and correctly remediate against them. So our client commissioned ACOM, um, our client was a large housing developer, and they wanted to build a housing estate with about 2,500 homes, retails, um, shops, schools, libraries, pubs, care homes, a, a proper community, um, on an area of brownfield land, which had been previously been a landfill site. The site had been disused for years, but it needs to be remediated before any building could start, as the uh, developers had very little idea of what could be potentially be down there. So we were contacted, and um, we needed to define the landfill site in three dimensions and locate any areas of leachate and uh, try and find the densest areas of fill and give the clients some idea of what might be down there. So our landfill site was uh, Holmbush Farm Landfill in um, Crawley in West Sussex. It was used to dispose of inert waste and was believed to be about 14 metres deep. It had been capped and closed in 2006. So if you've got any friends that live down there, it's probably all OK now. The regional geology of the area um, shows the river mole deposits and alluvium to be towards the west of the site, overlying a wheel clay formation. The area once used to be used for the extraction of clay, and there are still several bell pits across the site that we believed had been filled during the landfill um, operations. After finding out more about the scope of the site and works, a risk assessment needed to be created to enable us to go on site safely. So the client sent us this um, map of the area, which shows a lot of the problems that we were going to encounter on site. So at the top, if I can point properly here, there's some Japanese knotweed, there's some old bell pits off to this corner of the site, there's some newly planted trees that we had to avoid, lots of stockpile materials above the landfill, lots of scrap metal and things in the central area, a watercourse here and a little crossing there. But unfortunately, this didn't have all of the hazards that we were going to encounter. And although it helped us plan our survey and our, um, our site walkover a lot better, when we still got to the site, we had to do a dynamic risk assessment as we found areas of quicksand, huge mounds of scrap metal, and lots of standing water and leachate. And obviously, we don't know what's in those standing water areas. So this is how we planned our survey and where we put our survey lines. So a geophysical survey was required to determine the depths of made ground and the interface with the underlying wheel clay below. The clients were also interested in the different types of fill within the sites of the landfill. Landfills are traditionally made up of smaller cells, which represent areas of different fill, um, which then make up the whole site. Some, uh, some cells might be metallic material, household waste, or um, things from construction, but they'll be segregated as the landfill is... is growing. 
So my colleague created a survey scope and suggested conducting an electrical resistivity tomography survey complemented by an electromagnetic survey. The resistivity survey measures changes in electrical resistance produced by variations in the materials in the ground. So these differences can be caused by lots of different factors, from changes in the geology, say uh, a basalt over a sandstone, or local environment changes such as water content or compaction. Though we thought the landfill contents would not be as compact as the underlying geology, we hope we'd be able to image the base of the fill. So these blue lines represent where we put our uh, profiles for the resistivity surveys. Um, this technique will also allow us to image at depth, so we could hopefully get um, sufficient readings below 14 metres to see the base of the landfill across the site and create a good diagram, really. So this was going to be complemented by an electromagnetic survey, which is all those yellow wiggly lines everywhere that I'll tell you about in a second. So these are some photos of us on site. You can see large areas of standing water, the quicksand that we encountered, <laughs> loads of scrap metal. In the forefront, there's a cable across, which is one of our, here you go, one of our uh, resistivity lines with the electrodes all in. The only photo of me on site, I was there, I promise. <laughs> and then those are my colleagues and the uh, EM31, which is what we used for the electromagnetic survey. So this method um, measures the electrical conductivity, which is the opposite of resistance, uh, within the ground. So an electromagnetic field is propagated by a transmitter at one end of that boom, which goes into the ground. Um, the properties of the ground, be it water, clay content, or buried metallic, buried metallic objects, create eddy currents within that propagated field, which is then picked up by the, by the receiver at the other end. So the differences in the primary field, which is induced, and the secondary field, which is generated, are recorded um, by the receiver, um, and they form the basis of our data collection. The target depth for this type of survey is limited to six metres. However, we thought it would be most useful for defining the types of fill within the cells of the landfill in a, in a shallow way. So these are the results from the uh, electromagnetic survey. Uh, the electromagnetics are, uh, we collected two different types of results, so that's the quadrature and the in-phase responses. We had to measure both for our survey, as they both measure different things. We needed to define the edge of the landfill and the materials, and try and find the individual cells and their contents where we could. Uh, the quadrature readings are ideal for finding changes in EM response over a large area, as they, as they measure the apparent conductivity. And this is the average of conductivity of all the minerals over an area that you're surveying. So that's what it's called, the uh, apparent conductivity. So um, areas that appear more conductive when using the quadrature readings are areas more of clay-rich materials or water-saturated areas. The in-phase component measures a more discrete and localised variations in the magnetic field, and it's thereby known to represent discrete buried metal objects. And by interpreting and collecting these two data sets together, I had a better understanding of whether anomalies were caused by groundwater properties or geology or contaminants or buried metal objects that were part of the fill and the, the makeup of the landfill. So here you can see um, red areas here represent um, areas where data is missing. There were dangerous um, spoil heaps or metal that we couldn't, we couldn't take readings over those areas. Here, the pink areas show areas of high conductivity due to buried metal objects or material with a higher organic content. This yellow area here is interpreted from the in-phase response, which suggests buried metal objects. And the blue area, that, well, you can see the blue area, it's interpreted from the in-phase response again, which is consistent with changes in the fill material and clay capping materials, and represents an area that has a lack of... Um, buried metal, so it's a very a low electromagnetic response. So here's a section of um, the resistivity lines that we did um, during that site. And you can see from profile three, in some places it was up to 30 metres deep with landfill, which was significantly greater than what the client had warned us about to start with in the death study. 
Profile two shows a layer of conductive fill, which is the blue section at the top, between five and 15 metres deep, with localised thinning of materials, right here, which could be the, uh, the bonding between the cells within the landfill. The areas that have given low resistance readings yet fall below the proposed base of landfill, such as here, may be linked to pooling leachate below the fill and the collection of this leachate onto the, into the underlying materials. And this, the collection of seven profiles in all allowed us to characterise the site and the underlying geology, and it gave the client a model of the landfill below the surface, which would inform them of the, the whole volume before they could remediate against it. Oh, no, that one. So in summary, we fulfilled the client scope by carrying out a geophysical survey across the landfill site, and it gave them valuable information to enable them to remediate the landfill site and prepare the ground to build the new houses in the community that we now see today. Thank you very much. So thank you for coming, and also thanks to the Geological Society for arranging this event and allowing me to give this short presentation on the Silea Dam in Cyprus. My name's William, and I'll be giving this uh, short talk, uh, on, and I'll aim to provide an overview of the geology around the dam, some considerations to the engineering implications of the dam, and a short summary highlighting how geology can impact a project such as this. And I was lucky enough to, to visit the dam after construction while studying engineering geology. Uh, and the photos in this pre presentation were taken during the field trip to Cyprus. So this is the location of, of the dam, uh, so in, in the circle there, close to the, the political border, uh, and near the town of Lefka. It was, it was constructed back in 2010 to manage the flow of the Cargotas River. The Salea Dam forms just one part of the Salea Valley project, which is a large scheme to store and convey water for irrigation. The crest length is 440, 444 metres long and 56 metres high. The dam has a storage capacity of 4.5 million cubic metres and comprises a clay core with basalt rock fill. So as part of this, this visit, I was asked to summarise the regional geology and which would allow, allow, allow us or allow myself to understand why this location was chosen to, to, to build this uh, embankment dam. So the dam, the dam site lies within the Trudos Terran, which is a large anticline which forms the Trudos Mountains. So this region here. Near to the axis of the anticline, ultramafic rocks have been mapped and sheeted dikes can be found at the limbs. Towards the edges at lower ground, there are lavas and ore deposits. It is thought that the Trudos anticline is a result uplift above a subducting slab. The geology of the site consists of alluvial deposits along the river, weathered scree slopes, basalt, andesite, and diabase intrusions, and the lower pillow lava formation belonging to the Trudos ophiolite sequence. An ophiolite is the name given to a suite of rocks which comprise of ultramafic, plutonic, and intrusive rocks which are derived from the upper mantle and oceanic crust. This particular ophiolite sequence was thought to be produced by a combination of sea floor spreading and the collision of the Eurasian plate with the African plate. So this is a typical sequence of the Trudos ophiolite suite. At the base, rocks such as tectonized Harzburgite can be found. This slight green hue, as you can just about make out, may be the result of serpentinization, which is the reaction of seawater with ultramafic rocks in this case. One theory is that the chemical alteration of minerals causes the rock to reduce in density, so instead of being subducted, it becomes more buoyant and is uplifted to the surface. But for the depths that the Salea Dam construction is concerned, we would be more interested in the pillow lavas, and this is the photo of, the, of some weathered basalt pillow lavas of a partially failed bench slope in a disused copper and sulfide, sulfur mine. The failure of some of these benches was controlled by preferential weathering along the axes of the individual pillows. <coughs> to elaborate on these points, 
the geologists or engineering geologists will be tasked with identifying how appropriate the site is to the construction of a dam. This will involve reviewing thematic maps and previous site investigation reports, as well as arranging site access and geological and geomorphological mapping. Rock mass mapping can give a good semi-quantitative approach to assessing the strength of the foundation and abutment material. This helps to assess whether it can support the loads imposed by the embankment fill. During the intrusive investigation, field and lab testing would be carried out to characterize the rock mass by obtaining the site-specific geotechnical parameters for design purposes. Naturally, the ground's interaction with water plays a key role to the embankment dam development, as groundwater can, can occur underneath the dam through rock mass that contains interconnected and closely spaced fractures. The, the result may be a, a reduction in the reservoir capacity and increased scouring downstream. Additionally, the movement of water on fill materials can cause slaking and unwanted chemical reactions, which alter its engineering behavior. So the geologist needs to factor this into his or her assessment. Um, geomaterials for construction. In this case, the basalt, basalt rock fill of the Solea Dam was locally derived, which meant that transportation costs were low and the embankment could begin construction immediately. So as a geologist, it is important to consider consider the use of sustainable construction materials to keep costs down and to reduce the project's carbon footprint. Finally, the impact of slope movements and seismic shaking can have severe effects in dam performance. The design must account for this by implementing, implementing mitigation measures, such as a thicker base to stop piping failure, use of engineered materials to dampen propagation of seismic waves. Seismic waves. These geohazards should be planned accordingly, and I would suggest installing monitoring equipment and carrying out scheduled maintenance. And the, the consultant of the Salea Dam project was generous enough to provide their geological map of the area, and I appreciate it's quite hard to read, so I've got the hard copies with me, so perhaps in the break, if you're, if you're well, interested, I can, I can bring it out and you can have another look. <coughs> so this red line here is the dam crest and the reservoir is to the south here and this blue color refers to the first to the intrusions which outcrop in the western abutment <coughs> they are typically basaltic andesitic and diabasic in composition with intercalations of pillar lavas the dip of the intrusions appears to be to the west at 75 to 85 degrees dip angle the majority of the site comprises of the lower pillar lava formation, which is the, the green, green area here, which over, uh, pillow, lower pillow lava formation, which overlies alter, alterating dikes and seals. From the plan, we can see immediate that, immediately that there are a number of faults which intersect the dam crest and the steep dip of dikes, which could give rise to construction problems. From the cross-section, the, the consultant ordered point load tests to be carried out to ascertain the strength of the rock. These values generally show that the rock is more competent at greater depths. However, there appears to be limited data for the founding surface on which to rely on. Also, the point load test is dependent on lithology and the quality of samples. In this case, I would suggest perhaps carrying out a more reliable alternative to obtain the strength of the bedrock, as well as a possible sediment analysis of the weathering zones across the dam section. Permeability testing was also conducted using pack tests in the boreholes. The bedrock has a lower permeability compared with the material above rockhead, which we would come to expect. Although, I predict that the permeability between the two zones is not consistent across the entire length, and that testing near the identified fault zones would likely yield different values. Finally, the RQD This, uh, this band here, gives a, uh, the RQD gives a good indicator of the fracturing of the rock mass. And by observing the data, it can, it can be seen that the pillow lavas are quite variable in terms of fracturing, and this is possibly associated with the presence of shear zones and brecciated rock within close proximity to the faults previously seen on the geological map. So here are some of the, some of the methods that were employed to assist with construction and maintenance of the 
of the embankment dam. Further grouting was conducted in the pillow lavas since they tended to be less resistant to weathering. Uh, compaction of the field was also carried out to increase density and filters were installed to manage drainage through the upstream and downstream sections. Despite all these measures implemented, seepage was encountered along the western road which leads up to the downcrest, even though concrete spillways had been built downstream. Perhaps this water flow originated from the zone of weathered basalt, which had not been properly grouted. <coughs> it was also feasible to suggest that the contact of the dike and seal intrusions with the pillow lavas would, would likely yield significant flow. The fault zone shown in the ground model can act as conduits for water to move from the hilltops down through the abutment and find its way downstream. If left untreated, this could result in piping failure at the base of the dam. To summarise, the geological model is the interpretation of the ground conditions, conditions and this can be produced during the preliminary stage of the project. The validity of the model stems from the understanding of the ground conditions, but engineering geological experience can prove pivotal to the safe and successful completion of the dam. Now with the basic model, it would be easier to identify the areas of uncertainty and plan the design of the dam accordingly. The ground model is considered a live document so as the project moves into construction and even post-construction, it should be continually revised by the ge geologist and engineer alike. So to summarise, I believe the engineering geological works carried out by those involved in the Salaya Dam project were appropriate, but perhaps with more time and budget, they would have been able to identify the cause and location of the seepage and come up with an effective means of managing the problem before construction. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ben Tostel. Today I'm going to be talking about the investigation and stabilisation of a landslide in Tomadon. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the death study, the uh, central role of field work, and how the engineering geologist was pivotal in coming up with the, uh, the right solution. So, as I'm sure you might have seen on the news, there was extensive flooding in the Calder Valley towards the latter end of 2015. Imagine waking up on Boxing Day to have floor wall, floodwaters halfway up to your first floor. Um, as part, following the flooding, there was extensive damage to flood defences, and that was part of the remediation of many of the, many of the sites. I'm going to be talking about one specifically today that was located in Tomadon. So, Tomadon is roughly halfway between Leeds and Manchester. Uh, within the Calder Valley, well, on a tributary of the River Calder. Um, so what was the issue? Well, as you, there was a gaming wall that extended from here to here. Um, gaming walls, uh, basically a metal mesh basket filled with clay stone, often found on the side of motorways, and they are used as retaining walls or scour erosion protection. So what happened here was the uh, wall was scoured and undermined, and as it was completely washed away, never to be found again, there was a little slope in a little landslide in the steep slope that it was retaining. Now, the client was very concerned, the uh, Environment Agency, due to the presence of a culvert just downstream, and these residential properties, should further movement happen in that steep slope, it may potentially block the culvert and lead to further flooding. Um, so, before going to site, I conducted a bit of a death study, basically looking at all the information that's available online, um, to be aware of any geotechnical risks. Now, the site, so looking at a geological map, you can see the site is located with this red horseshoe. You've got the uh, Julescape water feeding into the River Calder here with some alluvium. Um, the geology itself is comprised sandstone and mudstone, um, and the uh, geology is quite lying sub-horizontal. Imagine what contours look like in a valley. You've got this Ving shape up the valley, but what the main thing that stands out from this is the presence of extensive landslides. So you've got landslides that are either side of the site, but you've also got extensive landslides throughout the valley itself. If we then look at the aerial photography, this is now viewing it to the south. It's quite sort of telling where these land <laughs> map landslides are. Um, here's the site again down there. But also, what was also a concern was one of the features for the one behind my site itself. Um, so we've got things like, yeah, we've got this, I sort of named it, Terrace behind the site, you've got extensive areas of hummocky ground all over, you've got all these small slum blocks, and you've got a backscarp that also extends into this uh, quarry there at the top. Um, and this sort of, all building into my geological model, looks a little bit like a uh, 
rotational slip slides, similar to what you would find if you were travelling on the M62 down into Manchester, you'd, you'd see them out the window. Um, so, uh, building on from that, produce a bit of a cross-section based on my observations so far. So, the majority of the site itself is mudstone, but I inferred uh, at least two fairly surfaces, so one behind that terrace, and then one back to where the quarry is over there. Um, so, the grey area is the uh, bit of material I've hypothesised has already failed, but it, and the landslide being on a 100 metre scale, extending kilometres laterally down the, uh, down the site itself. But it's worth bearing in mind that our little failure is actually at the toe of this much larger, greater landslide system. Um, so the next stage in the project was to actually go out to site, get a boots dirty and build upon uh, a geological model. Um, so here I produce a bit of a geomorphological map, uh, the, not just seeing the uh, features you see, but also how they all fit together and where they are sort of written reference to each other is very important. So we've got the culvert that's just up here, um, and then we have a gabion wall. So this is what's left of the gabion wall, there's only a few baskets. Um, you can see how poorly constructed they are. The, if you compare that to the example picture I showed at the beginning, it's uh, very poorly placed. Then beyond this, we have uh, a section of steep slope that, uh, that's directly behind the failed area. Then there was a very distinct change in slope geometry. So you've got this uh, flat terrace where you had sort of a debris mound beyond it into the slope, but you also had a sp springs and water flowing over the surface, uh, which was of significant concern. And then beyond this, you have the very over-steepened, steep glacial valley, possibly part of that much larger terrace block uh, that we saw, um, saw earlier. So drawing another sort of cross-section through this much, uh, through the toe of the slope where our site was, you've got the uh, gabion wall down here, you've got the uh, erosion on the front face, and then inferring at least three distinct failure surfaces um, with the water spring from the debris mound um, flowing over the surface. So uh, water is very, it's of great concern for a, uh, especially a landslide system or because um, it acts to sort of push apart the grains, weakening the uh, strength of the soil and also erodes the, uh, the slope the surface itself. So the uh, next stage of the project was to conduct a bit of a ground investigation. So this is where we sample uh, the ground. In this case, we sampled on that sort of flat terrace where there was that distinct change in slope geometry, um, basically to work out what the ground is made out of, how it behaves and how strong it is. Um, so, due to the steep slope and difficult access, uh, we could only really do uh, one day of handheld window sampling. So, this is just taken from the internet to give you an idea. We've got two guys holding a drill. I sort of imagined that if it, if it got stuck on something, they'd spin around in a circle, but <laughs> that didn't, didn't happen. Um, but essentially, they're hammering in a sample tube into the ground, uh, sampling the material. So, what did we find? Well, we found some superficial deposits, just... Uh, just over a metre, so that sort of comprised uh, clay, sand, gravels. At the upper portion, there was a bit of brick, so a bit of it was sort of made ground. Um, and then beyond that, we were down into weathered mudstone. So this is what the weathered mudstone looked like. Um, you can see the, the darker areas, that sort of uh, stuff that's not fully decomposed, but then you can see how it's sort of descending to the, uh, decomposing to this uh, greenish grey clay. Um, so, pulling together all the bits of information that we've used so far, so we've got our death study, we've highlighted the wider instability, we've been to site and confirmed our suspicions on uh, instability, and now we've conducted some intrusive ground investigation. Uh, we can all these feed together to uh, help us come up with remediation options for that gabion wall at the toe. So, the first option we looked at was a regrade, so it's considered quite a, a cheap option. It basically involves slackening that a uh, steep section of slope, uh, which means it's less likely to fail. However, considering it's at the toe of that much larger landslide system, it was disregarded instantly, uh, instantly because uh, you could potentially lead to failure of what does is seemingly a very dormant landslide system, but you don't want to be uh, lessening or, or promoting any failure in that material. The next we looked at was, well, why don't we just put up another gabion wall there? Quite a Quite, client quite liked doing a, a like for like replacement. Well, the gabion wall that was there before had completely failed. So you need extensive uh, excavation of temporary works. Uh, we're in that steep slope. 
and they're not very, uh, they can't accommodate much strain and stress if there's any movement, so there's a risk of blocking that culvert again. Um, so the next stop you looked at was soil nails. It's essentially where you drill holes into the slope, leave it as it is in situ, um, and you pin it together, essentially filling it with bottom with grout. Um, this increases the, uh, the strength. So although this is a, regarded as a slightly more expensive issue, it actually uh, retains that steep section of slope, uh, improving its stability uh, in-house. Now, that was the option we went for, but there were concerns due to that high water pressure that we def certainly need some drainage improvements. So what I did fail to mention before was that there had been a few attempts to increase the, uh, to decrease the water pressure with broken drainage and broken pipes. So the idea would be to, to fix them up and also maybe add a crest drain to drain off some of that water and lower the, uh, the water pressures in the slope. Um, so this is the, uh, the final, final solution that is as yet not built. So we've got the uh, saw nails going into the slope about eight meters. Um, and then we've got scour protection at the toe just to prevent uh, any future flood water eroding in. So this is a arena mattress, which is essentially a smaller version of a gabion wall that will just protect the, uh, the bottom here. Um, so just to conclude, um, yeah, the uh, project highlights the importance of doing a death study, uh, identifying the wider geological issues, the following through on your field work, um, and how the wider geological context is very important when coming up with a, uh, a good remediation option, and the engineering geologist is key and pivotal throughout. Uh, and so just to leave you with this thought and this picture, which was a failed landslide during the uh, Boxing Day 2015 floods, will uh, climate change and the extreme weather conditions that were experienced by the people of uh, Calderdale and Hebden Bridge and Tomadon uh, lead to an increase of land stability issues for us geologists and engineers uh, throughout our careers. Um, so thank you and any questions?